got to a point with me, I often wondered, like I've never shot a deer, I've never shot anything in my life. I, I never hunted, I'm just not that type of guy. But there's no doubt in my mind uh, that I think I would have killed Wynn. There can often seem in Canada a shortage of world-class events. Wars, major catastrophes, kind of moments that makes time stand still. It gives us reason to notice where we were and what we were doing when they happened. Many Canadians do know where they were when John Kennedy was assassinated. I was in Mr. Ralph's grade 12 chemistry class at Etobicoke Collegiate, and when Neil Armstrong first set foot on the moon. But only one Canadian event has left a similar trail of memory. Paul Henderson's goal with 34 seconds to go that won the Canada-Russia series. It's incredible. I still talk about that goal probably 300 days a year. All, every Canadian that I meet for the first time will invariably tell me exactly where they, were. where they were, what they were doing, and I continue to get stories all the time. This is Luzhniki Arena. Today, they are preparing for a rock concert. 17 years ago, I was here, less than 200 feet away. The score was five to five. It was the most exciting moment of my hockey life. most successful hockey team. Here is in factories and offices all over the Soviet Union, a fundamental struggle is being waged over power, over history, most of all over the rights and place of the individual. The struggle for the most part isn't visible. It's a sound. Words stored up for a lifetime are suddenly rushing out Words that care less of the glories of space or sport or military adventure. Words that want to know, what about me? This is Sasha Harlamov. In 1972, his father, Valery, played in the Canada-Soviet series. Valery and his generation gave over most of their lives for their country's glory. Not seeing fruits of that sacrifice, the new generation wonders why. Like Sasha Harlamov, they want a better life. Only a wall away, wearing the black sweater of the outcast, Major Vyacheslav Fetisov skates through his final Red Army practice. He doesn't know it yet, but later this afternoon, after a meeting with coach Viktor Tikhonov, he'll be released from the team. In two weeks, he'll be out of the army. It's what he wants. Fetisov wants control over his life, but Tikhonov will not yield. Iron-spined adversaries, they are symbols of this monumental struggle. Я думаю, что, в общем, 
Это неправильно, и то, что он может оскорбить. Оскорбить человека просто за то, что он ошибся в игре. А игра это выигрывает в игре тот, кто меньше ошибается, наверное, это закон. Для кого не секрет, так он представляет, что сколько, сколько он грязи, брани за одну игру выливает на игроков, не говоря уже потом, в разборах. Это, в общем, постоянная система унизить человека, оскорбить, поставить его в зависимость от себя и потом им крутить, как, как он захочет. Это, в общем, система, которая была в стране у нас при Сталине. И, в общем, она у нас где-то сейчас в команде она практикует. Тиканов's job is to win every game, every championship, every tournament, every year. Значит, тренер должен находить какие-то новые условия. Я вот имею мотивацию, чтобы добраться души, добраться сюда, чтобы снова э, поставить перед ними какую-то новую задачу. Так, первым до конца, до конца защитник на, на ускорение. Tikhanov is the system itself, distant, cold, all-powerful. He monopolizes all favors. He has the tools to manipulate and the deeply ingrained instincts never to give them up. Tikhanov, он не понимает нас игроков. Он работает с нами теми же методами, что и 10-12 лет назад. Он также со мной обращается, как как будто мне было 20 лет. Илларионов 20, и Макаров 20. Он не видит нас людей, он не видит нас личностей. Ему это, в общем, не знаю, ему прийти, может, он не видел, не хотел видеть личности ни в Третьяке, не хотел видеть личности ни, не знаю, ни в Петрове, ни в Карлаве, ни в Ке, ни в ком, ни в, ни в нашей пятерке, которая много лет, в общем, делала результат, так прямо скажем. В общем, это его злит. Он считает, что Тихонов это весь советский хоккей он подменяет, он старается подменить с собой весь советский хоккей. He motivates by fear. He controls his players' lives. Tikhanov sees human weakness. He's blind to human strength. He believes no one should be left to their own devices. The workers can't be trusted. Пойдет первый час там. Против один, один, три. Ну мы отодвинем. Все вопросы касающиеся все социальные вопросы, касающиеся семьи, большей частью идет через главного тренера решение всех вопросов игроков. Я играю 13 год в команде ЦСКА и все ни разу не проиграли чемпионскую титул. Incredible, but disastrous for Soviet hockey. Tikhanov has won 12 straight championships by stripping the other teams of their best players. Soviet players can play where they want. Most want to live in Moscow. They want cars, money, travel. And Tikhanov can offer it all. With the best players, he's won world championships, world attention. But as usual, it's those at home who pay the price. Народу нужной стране и так же как и канадскому, в общем, престижно выиграть чемпионат мира. Вот, но при этом при всем забылись внутренние дела у нас в стране. Хоккеисты должны играть для своего, так сказать, народа, для своего зрителя, а уже потом играть на, так сказать, на других площадках в других странах. Tonight, the Red Army is set to clinch its 13th straight national championship. The crowd is one of the largest this season, though fewer than 8,000. Many fans have lost interest. Soviet hockey is stagnating. I've never been in so quiet a dressing room. Few words are exchanged between Tikhanov and his players amongst the players themselves. Tonight the opposing team is Kimik from Voskresensk, a town south of Moscow.
the Red Army recruits the best talent. As a result, players and coaches on other teams don't develop. With no competition, Army players don't improve. With no competition, fans stay away. This, more than all the national and world championships, is Tikhanov's legacy. He might be Canadian, American, West European. His haircut, his Mercedes, his ABC Calgary Olympics jacket. Five years ago, his look would have seemed disloyal. But Fetisov is the contemporary Soviet. Все проблемы у нас, в общем, в том, что, в общем, Тихонов, как говорится, продукт того поколения, которое сейчас осуждается. В общем, сейчас тяжело с нами работать, с молодыми, общем, мы не понимаем друг друга, поэтому, наверное, все проблемы у нас возникают. Когда у ворот идет борьба, у ворот, ты на отсюда пролетаешь, я... Nikolai Epstein, former Kimmich coach, Vladimir Korolov, deputy head of hockey, Igor Kuperman, journalist and fan. Tikhanov's critics are everywhere, and now they can speak out. Glasnost, the Soviet policy of openness, has made Tikhanov a victim. In the Soviet Union, players' benches are set back from the boards. Tikhanov confronts his players nose to nose. Officer to grunt. This is the army soldier. Судьбы спортсменов, судьбы людей, в общем, не того и не руководство, в общем, не интересует как таковых. У нас спортсмен заканчивает, они уже забывают сразу на следующий день. В общем, это самое, так сказать, страшная пора, когда ты уже в сознании ты знаешь, что ты сейчас нужен, а завтра нет. Это очень тяжело. Это тоже, в общем. Продукт. Не продукт, то есть это все выходит из этой системы вообще, что ты отработал как робот, отработанный механизм уходишь, и ты уже не нужен никому, а тебе его 30, чуть больше 30. Это катастрофа, приводит людей, в общем, действительно к краху, как то жизнь. Ну где теперь Бушгат? Мне он что-то сдавил. Not too many years ago, it seemed, Canadians and Soviets lived on two different planets. 1972. It would be Canada's coming out party. The year was 1972. Через полчаса наши ребята выйдут на лед против Soviets had beaten us year after year, our NHL professionals ineligible to play. Now we could use them. We knew we were the best, but more important, the world had to know. There is much that is special about Canada, but surrounded by countries richer, older, more powerful, we cling to every symbol. We had to win this series. It's hard to believe memories of that time. No hockey series, nothing could have meant that much. In 1972, to Canada, it did. You were a very young boy. At the time, Igor Cooperman was 15 years old. All that he knew about Canada was hockey. About the hockey in Canada, especially about the professionals. But uh, it is all that I knew about Canada, that there is a sixth team in NHL. 
like a, a lot of young boys, I'm sure, in the Soviet Union as well as Canada, you, you watch that series fairly closely. Yes. Very and, and remember some of the Canadian players? Oh, I remember all them in faces, in numbers, in wings, in position, all of them. Number 28. Bobby Clark. 33. Gilbert Perrault. 37. Mm, Jocelyn Jobramon. Jobramon, yes? <laughs> yeah, yes, he, it's, it's she, yes. Who? Number five. Brad Park. My heavens, you were watching. Number 29. Not, <laughs> <laughs> not interesting. <laughs> 17 years later, we talk about that time. Phil Esposito, Sir Savar, Paul Henderson. If you can just think about, I guess, international hockey, what you knew at that time. What did you know about the Soviets? I remember saying, my brother told me, said, why, why are we going? What are we doing? Why are we doing this? Who are we playing? And I said, I don't know. We're playing the Russians. How good can they be? I mean, uh, they've won world championships and they've won Olympics, but uh, they never played against the pros. Moscow, 1946, the first hockey game ever played in the Soviet Union. They learned skating and puck handling from a game called bandy, like field hockey on ice. They were so far behind us, we thought they could never catch up. While we summered on golf courses, they trained. More hours a day, more months a year. How good could they be? We never cared to find out. happened in that series? A lot of people did strange things in that series. I mean, Rod Gilbert was fighting. Now that Gilbert swings at him, it's just a Jean-Paul Parisi was threatening referees. Parisi is totally insane. I mean, what happened? Why did all of those things happen? To me, it was war. You know, I've, I've told Kenny this privately, and uh, I've said it uh, to a few people, but I, I've never really said it publicly, but uh, it got to a point with me, I often wondered, like, I've never shot a deer, I've never shot anything in my life. I, I never hunted, I'm just not that type of guy. But there's no doubt in my mind uh, that I think I would have killed Wynn. And that scares me. That really scares me sometimes. I. Uh, when I think about it, I mean, right now I think about it, I sort of get a little goosebumps and, because I think I would have killed him to win. I would have done anything to win. Absolutely anything. So I think in a war, maybe that's what happens. And it was our society against their society. And Phil Esposito is going to get a penalty as a result. It got to be such an emotional thing to me, and I, you know, I told my wife I will never, ever let myself get that emotionally involved in something again. The opening, as they dropped the ceremonial puck, and if you look at the tapes, I had to win that draw. I mean, I had to win that draw. <laughs> and this guy didn't even try, and that really aggravated me. I wanted to spear him or something. Try, you know? And when I remember I brought it back, and I put my hand up like, wow, we won the first face off. I mean, it was really weird. Building up, and it's very warm in the forum tonight. And at the same time, the fans are really on their toes. They hardly can wait to see the beginning of this game. There's the official face-off. Dryden is in goal for Canada. When I think back to that uh, that first game, I guess I, I don't think I've ever felt so vulnerable and inept. I mean, everything was going too fast for me. I couldn't catch up. I couldn't... All of the expectations that I had were going the other way. Every time I knew somebody was going to shoot, didn't shoot. And every time I knew that they were going to shoot someplace, they'd shoot someplace else. They'd hold on to the puck a little bit longer. I felt so helpless in the course of that game. And as you've said earlier, 
about feeling the agony of losing while the game is going on. Because they didn't give us anything that we were, we were told. I mean, we were told that Trechak couldn't stop anything. We were told that, well, yeah, they can skate, but they're not that great as skaters. Yeah, they can shoot, but they can't shoot that hard. Well, somebody should have told Donny Ari and Roxili. <laughs> they were going like crazy. And I, and I remember saying to Wayne Cashman, we've got, we've got a heavy duty problem. Like, we thought it was going to, I really thought we were, it was going to be a vacation. I mean, we thought we were just going to have yeah. a great time. I was going to get to play with Esposito and Cornway and Mahavlich and Dryden. Like and an all-star game. Sure, it was yeah. going to be such a great time. We were going to go there. And then all of a sudden, the good time was uh, you looked ahead and you got eight, and you knew it was a grinder. It's like that cartoon, very prim and proper guy, until he gets behind the wheel of a car and he turns into a maniac. I mean, uh, that's when I started to become a, a real maniac. They exposed us so utterly. Playing a different way, they made us see our game for the first time. By the Soviets, it's unbelievable. They're disciplined, totally disciplined athletes. We didn't like what we saw. Rough and unsophisticated, a style of play with little system or science. Players not quite in shape, a little too prosperous, whose team play was unambitious, who under stress became undisciplined, who by instinct went it alone. And the USSR had to beat in Canada in the first game of an eight-game series by a score of seven to three. We saw us, and at the end of the game, Canadian fans booed us and cheered them. Oh, I'm a little disappointed in the Canadians. In what way? The fact that they're not doing a lot of skating, they should be doing a little more back checking. The, the passing of the uh, Russian players, they seem to kick the puck up and put it on their stick right away, and it's, it's amazing how accurate they are with their passing. What have you noticed particularly about the series? Well, the Russians are a lot better than I expected them to be, <laughs> and I think that the Team Canada should start practicing a whole long time before. Rebuilding, winning in Toronto, tying in Winnipeg, disaster in Vancouver and leaving Canada down two games to one with one game tied. Now, at the end of the game, Phil, you were interviewed, and you said a few things. For the people that boo us, geez, I, I'm really, I, all of us guys are really disheartened and we're disillusioned and we're disappointed in some of the people. We cannot believe the bad press we've got, uh, the, the booing we've gotten in our own buildings. And if, if, if the Russians boo their, their players, if the fans, Russians boo their players, like some of the Canadian fans, I'm not saying all of them, some of them booed us, then I'll come back and I'll apologize to each one of the Canadians, but I don't think they will. I'm really, really, I'm really disappointed. I am completely disappointed. I cannot believe it. We came because we love Canada. And even though we play in the United States and we earn money in the United States, Canada is still our home, and that's the only reason we come. And I don't think it's fair that we should be booed. I was booed in this building. Larry Robinson was booed. I don't remember Kenny, but <laughs> most of the big names. <laughs> <laughs> but Rocket Richard was booed in this building. So uh, I think it was just the fact right. that the, the fans were so disappointed and they, they did let us know, and it probably hurt more than usual. But you, but you know what, Serge? You're right. You're right. You've been booed. I've been booed. We've all been booed. It was our country against their country. Do you understand? To me, that's different. That's absolutely, totally different. That, to me, was different. They had no business bonus. They want to show their displeasure, they show their displeasure. The press did enough for everybody, showing their displeasure on us. But the one thing that they didn't realize it was us. We didn't like it either. You think we wanted to lose? Did the people think we went out there to just let it happen? That we were going to lose? That we wanted to lose these games in Canada? Gee, we didn't want to lose those games. We wanted to win every stinking game. We wanted to make the dream come true that it was going to be eight in a row and send these guys packing back and let them stay in their communistic country and whatever it is. 3,000 Canadians made the pilgrimage to Moscow, following their boys on the road there when they were needed the most. Canadians knew little of the world in 1972 as players, officials, fans, 
We were inexperienced, uncomfortable in anything but our own backyard. And here we were in Moscow. with a team, most of whom had never been outside North America, it was far worse. Narrow beds, big pillows, the blankets that don't tuck in, the phone that rings when it shouldn't, the television whose words you don't understand, and the walls you can almost touch. And up in the ceiling, what's that? And the wire, where does that go? Just little things that as the tension of the series screwed tighter, became almost too much. I'm convinced, I don't know about you, we ate horse meat. I'm convinced of that. <laughs> I mean, I kept going, no, no. <laughs> but I, I'm convinced we ate horse meat at the end, at the end. Wasn't there some, the, the girls ate blackbird or something, or crow? Like bread. Black, no, no, no. There was, I don't know. No, it was the eggs that were green. I mean, they, <laughs> they, uh, they my wife, I got, they were served eggs one morning, and I, I can remember this because I, I went over to see it. The bottom of the, it, no butter in the pan, just the, the bottom of the egg was absolutely black, and the top, they were rotten, it was just green. God. And uh, they had actually, they had served that to them. This is Miss Olga Baranova, and Miss Baranova is going through the traditional Russian gesture of hospitality to guests of the Soviet Union. A presentation of a loaf of bread with salt on top, followed by a presentation of flowers as a traditional emblem of hospitality of the Soviet Union. Phil has, has slipped on a flower. The game begins. Then we went off, had a big lead, and lost it all in the third period. So the game is over, down three games to one, one game tied, three more games in Moscow. What, what were you feeling at that moment? I never thought we'd lose another game. And, and that's not s sitting here and saying it in retrospect. I mean, I remember saying it. I remember telling my brother, who was a goalie then, he was upset like, uh, he was, he didn't want to hear that. I said, we're never going to lose another, we're going to beat these guys. We're not going to lose another game. Also think that way. But I think at that time, after we lost the first game, the confidence changed side. They were overconfident. They were sure of beating us at that time. They were sure to win the series at that point, And uh, we were scared like hell. Right is going back into the net. Game six, second period, we had a lead. The Canadian fans had been angry at us, had admired the Soviets. Then we took penalties. One after another, 29 minutes, the Soviets took four. The game, the series, that fundamental something hockey meant to Canadians was being taken away. Two men down, backed into our final corner, players and fans together, we fought back. A high lob, 13 in the corner. He's coming out in front of Lechenko, here's a shot. We won game six. From now on, it was us versus them. 
you know, it really was a, sort of a remarkable effort when you consider we were in the penalty box for quite a bit of the game. And as you mentioned with the, uh, the Russian power play, uh, you know, you often don't get away with it. But everybody worked extremely hard, and uh, the result was okay. In watching the crowd and, and listening to the crowd at that point, the 3,000 Canadians that traveled over to Moscow, it was like suddenly then they really could be heard as if there was this sense of desperation and that everybody was in on it together for one last crack. I, I remember hearing them. I remember hearing them. And uh, what was it? Uh, da da Canada and yet, yet Soviet. If you remember, Phil, I think we had one telegram was uh, 20,000 names on yeah, the telegram. That's right. Uh, on the wall there. We knew we had, uh, I felt that we had the population behind us like ever before and I don't know if that's what you ask and I don't think we'll see that anymore I don't think you could get the country together behind one team like that play beyond the time it's if you're tired you're tired yes, that's what they just say. on four afternoons canada stopped and watched live from moscow for game eight a thursday afternoon 7.5 million people five million watched the replay at night never before never since never again about the day after the seventh game and the day before game eight, knowing that one last game would decide this whole series? Well, I don't know. My, I was such a high from the seventh game. I had scored, I'd scored a goal with about two and a half minutes left where I'd beaten two defensemen and they'd beaten Trechiak. I'd, I'd never even done that in practice before. <laughs> <laughs> to make the last, oh, it was the greatest goal I've ever scored in my life. And I was such a high from the scoring that goal to make the eighth game, I was just on seventh heaven. At the end of the second period in the eighth game, it's five to three. What happened between the end of the second period and the beginning of the third period? I can remember Harry saying that, listen, we, we need to get one early. We don't open it up, but if we get one early, then we're going to be okay. And that's exactly uh, what happened. I can, I can tell you the play. I can see it like it was yesterday. We scored 5-4. Five, five, and then um, I remember a face-off to the left of Kenny. And I says, because Cornway was playing with me, and I think Brad Park. Yeah, it was Brad Park made the pass. I said, Brad, I'm going to win this so-and-so draw. I said, Yvonne, just blast up that wing. And it, it didn't happen. I won the draw, and they intercepted. But then somehow or other, I got the pass from Brad up about the red line. And I was cutting in, and I took the shot, the puck went behind the net, and there was a, a rebound, and, and Cornwallier put it in. By I remember that one, but uh, Paul's goal, uh, I remember the guys yelling on the bench at me, Phil, Phil, there wasn't any way in the world that I was going off, none.
mean, that's the closest I ever came to really loving another guy. I mean, I love this guy. I mean, I literally loved him. I mean, I loved him. I, I think if I had had a, a, a million dollars, I would have given it, given it to him right there. Well, you got it today. You didn't have it. <laughs> I don't love you that much anymore. <laughs> Do you ever think back on the series and just shake your head and as at something so improbable? I mean, it, it went absolutely the way it shouldn't have gone. Right from the first game of the series, right down to the last 34 seconds. I mean, did, do you ever have a feeling that there's some kind of a, a sense of destiny that's involved in all of that? I've seen guy winning Stanley Cup, and I was, I'm one myself, and always state that that 72 series is the, the the thing that I will remember the most. And I think it's the same thing for everybody. You know, and I guess we get farther away from it. You just, I mean, it's got to die, but I mean, it's not going to die. I mean, it's just, it's, it's indelibly written in Canadians' hearts. And the thing about it, they felt a part of it. You know, like sure. we, they always say we, they don't say you did this. Well, we as Canadians did it. Won, but it seemed we could never win again. The Soviets had come so far, so fast, they would become unbeatable. Canadians assumed that if we are ahead, someone is gaining. Now, even in hockey, destiny had caught up. But 17 years later, things aren't what we thought they'd be. winter of 1989, the Red Army team, the pride of Soviet hockey, is in open rebellion against their coach. Fetisov is gone, Larionov is next, others are about to follow. These barracks at Arkhanyovskoye, near Moscow, are the symbol. Six days a week, ten months a year, away from their families. Vladimir Krutov, Igor Larionov and their teammates live here. Tikhanov and his generation believe that this is what it takes to win. Gets to you after eight years. Is it the, is it the boredom? Сейчас есть такие. Потом будут, что я практик, я знаю, я много работал. Меня не убедишь. guys like you before. Твое мнение меня не интересует. Guys like you before who were saying the same thing. There will be after. There are now. And that doesn't interest me. It's not going to change anything. Players see Canadians who play just as well, who live different lives, and ask why. They're fed up. What about me, they ask. They want perestroika in hockey. His wife, Elena. Вот, поэтому все трудности, которые у нас есть, они будут только после окончания хоккейной карьеры. И не все, не все значит, спортсмены, не все хоккеисты э, могут их преодолеть. Потому что за долгие годы э, человек привыкает, что за него все делают. Именно э, та система, которая у нас введена в хоккее, именно система сборов, тренировочных лагерей, Человек э, расслабляется, то есть попадает в определенный режим, в течение которого, в течение 10 лет, он просто забывает определенные житейские навыки, необходимые для жизни, для реальной жизни. Еще такая интересная деталь. Вот бывает отпуск у них один раз, значит, в году, там 20, сколько, месяц, да, 30 дней. И вот когда они приходят домой то настолько трудно перестроиться, поскольку мы уже привыкли, у нас вот определенная своя какая-то жизнь без мужа. Я знаю, что я утром встаю, я делаю то-то, 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 то-то. У меня какие-то свои уже дела. И когда он приходит, то первые там пять дней становится просто как-то даже странно, что нужно как-то еще его подключать тоже сюда, как будто этого человека вообще не существовало раньше. И потом уже, когда вот наконец-то ты к этому привыкаешь, в этот момент его опять забирают, как раз начинается опять сезон, И вот тут становится невыносимо тяжело, тут плачешь, потому что думаешь, настолько привык к нему. В общем, ужасно. 
Nikolai Epstein, open and vocal critic of the system, was once Larionov's coach in Voskhia's sense. Larionov and others were taken from him to feed Red Army's appetite. Here in Voskhia's sense, an industrial town 90 kilometers south of Moscow, the problems of the Soviet system are in evidence. It is a tragedy, says Epstein, raiding all of the teams for their best players just to strengthen the Red Army. What about my team? What about the people of Voskresensk? Why must we pay such a price? Another problem. Most Soviet kids play hockey outdoors. Warmer winters mean shorter hockey seasons and Voskia Sensk has only one indoor rink. And uh, my favorite picture is on, on the wall is the same, two, two, two pictures. Thousands of miles away, evidence of Canada, the ultimate game, Voskia Sensk versus Team Canada 1972. The Soviets are just beginning to learn. Players need fans. Hockey is entertainment requiring promotion, spectacle, and money. That a healthy domestic game makes for a healthy international game. Once the Soviets just worked harder, now they need resources and the Soviet Union is not a rich country. Vladimir Korolov, deputy head of Soviet hockey. If I go to Luzhniki to watch Seska play against Dinamo or Spartak, the arena is full. Against Leningradska, or tractor, there are only a few thousand people there. What's the problem? У нас по сути дела очень слабо поставлена пропаганда. Я имею в виду информация о матчах. У нас прошел вот три-четыре года назад очень такой большой, ну его нельзя назвать, но такой период, когда шла такая борьба с хулиганскими элементами с нарушениями общественного порядка. То есть, по сути дела, он запрещалось кричать, подниматься, там, скакивать, переживать и прочее, прочее. Надо было сидеть, как в опере, молча, так сказать, сопереживать проходящее. Это тоже вызвало обратную реакцию зрителя. Он не стал ходить на стадион. Зачем ему сидеть, как мумия? nine or ten weak teams. In basketball, two good teams, many weak teams. But isn't it the, that drive for competition between teams that really creates the drama and the interest in sport? The Soviet Union is changing. Things here were always definite. Traditions, expectations immutable. Some things right, the rest always wrong. Now, Coke machines, one-armed bandits, Soviet players in the NHL. Images that clash and challenge what's right, what's possible. <laughs> Noisy fans, banners, an organ. Advertising on boards, on jerseys too. Universal chants and cheers. even money. 
And now that money is allowed to matter, Vladimir Kukurin makes sports deals. When I look around the arenas, I see the board advertising. I know that it's not exactly new, but it's, it's fairly recent. Uh, watching the Spartak team play the other night, and on their sweaters, Giza, the uh, Italian agricultural company. A year or so ago, this would have been an unimaginable conversation. Where will it all go? Is somebody in the world uh, thinking that uh, the two countries, like uh, Soviet Union and United States, will agree very fast to reduce the armaments and completely to change the attitude toward each other. See, it's all the consequences of the new policy in the Soviet Union. And uh, putting me such a question, you were uh, worried about something. Where do it go? Just, uh, what are you worried about? Where can it go? First, it's uh, our normal hum human relations and normal business relations. Are you saying then that if McDonald's came to you and said, we want to put the golden arches on the sweaters of the Red Army, because they're a very popular team, they travel all around the world, and we want to make that commercial connection, that's possible? Why not? This is the most newspaper. Yes. <laughs> yes. Since 1972, Canadians and Soviets have gone through good times and bad, and though we would never have believed it then, we've reached a kind of competitive equilibrium. They can't bury us, we can't bury them. <laughs> can I, can I, can, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Hockey and world affairs are played in a competitive pack. Maybe size and power aren't destiny after all. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's in, Rus in Russian, yes? It's number 29. It, 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 can. it is the, the, largest, the largest present which I dream all my, all my life. In 1972, Canadians entered the world and were forever changed by it. Now it's the Soviets' turn. And if nothing here is now unimaginable, what is possible is another story. Their struggle and ours goes on. There are no final victories. Thank you very much. Thank you. One more time.